Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for coming. We've got a, little, a couple little preliminaries. We've got a couple endorsements. And uh, we're going to try to make it quick and uh, get to our main guest, of course. That's why we have all gathered. My name is Drew Ivers. I'm from Webster City over in Central Iowa. And I'm Terry Ron Paul's campaign here in the state of Iowa. And, you know, I just want to remind us all that uh, our founders, when they were framing our Constitution, they frequently referred to St. Paul, who also referred to and quoted Isaiah, and I quote, and you're familiar with this, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And after the document was completed, John Adams uh, made a, a marvelous statement, and he said that it was made, that document was made for a moral and religious people, and is wholly inadequate for it to govern any other. And so I believe that, and I pray that uh, as our founders acknowledge their dependence on divine power, we here at this gathering will also acknowledge that same dependence as we endeavor to restore our Constitution, to reclaim our Republic, and the, your role in that is to get yourself and your neighbors to Ames for the straw poll on August the 13th, Saturday, August the 13th. So grab your friends, grab your relatives, grab everybody that's supportive of this candidate, of Ron Paul, and get them to Ames. At this time, it's my privilege to introduce to you Jeff Leakey. And Jeff uh, Leakey is a longtime Dubuque resident from here in town, co-organizer and leader of the notable Dubuque Tea Party, a very active and effective party. With that, Jeff Leakey. everybody doing? Good. Good. For the record, I'm here personally today not as a representative of the Big Tea Party, but with that being said, I want to let it be known that I fully endorse Dr. Ron Paul, the President of the United States. So why am I supporting Dr. Paul? Because I cherish the Constitution and individual liberty. Ron Paul's the only candidate who supports a true return to constitutionally limited government and individual liberty. I'm tired of voting for one or the other side of the exact same coin, right? Since the turn of the 20th century, the progressive movement, the ruling elite have given us basically, if you vote for heads, you get a progressive Democrat. You vote for tails, you get a progressive Republican. We've got to change that. Rather than, rather than voting for one or the other side of the same coin, I want a totally new coin. Ron Paul, the gold standard. <laughs> now it's my privilege to introduce uh, Will Johnson. He was a United States Naval Intelligence. Uh, he does speak Hebrew and Chinese, and he's writing a new book, which is soon to be published, called uh, Noble World Order. So, Will Johnson. Brief. We have uh, our guest here, which is Ron, and I'm very fascinated to hear what he has to say because he's the one that turned me on to optimism back in 2007 during his race. Ron is unlike any other candidate, as many of you know, and he's someone that every generation has, has one, and this is ours. This is someone that actually represents truth, integrity, and credibility. And to speak to that, I have someone here that is also going to be endorsing Ron. It's a state central committee member, and his name's Jeremiah Johnson. Please welcome him. In 2010, according to the Center for Fiscal Accountability, almost two-thirds of what the average American produces goes to fund government. Millions of Americans are waking up to realize that government is not the answer to all of our problems. It is the problem. I first met the doctor back in 07 and have closely followed him since, and it's due time for our country to enjoy the prosperity intended for us by our nation's founders and to once again be the beacon of life, beacon of life and hope around the world. Ron Paul is a man of honor and integrity with no strings attached who will stand up to the tyranny and special interests in Washington advocating for we the people. 
I proudly endorse America and encourage you to voting for Dr. Congressman and the man of the people, Ron Paul. All right. I'm the last speaker, and I'm going to be very brief. I just wanted to make a few comments. Dr. Paul has been more than just a uh, statesman to many of us. He's been an example of what true optimism and integrity can do to the system. A lot of us, like myself and maybe others in the Tea Party, had thought, you know, it's been going this way for 100 years or more, and it'll probably continue because people say promises, but when they get in office, they lie. Well, this man has voted consistently for almost 30 years the same way, and he has credibility. There will be other politicians, there already have, and there will continue to be during this cycle, that will say similar things, but they lack the credibility which comes with that. So, without further ado, I would like us all to give a very warm welcome to Congressman Dr. Ron Paul. It's like it's all the time, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that's good. I want to introduce my uh, wife who's with me today. Carol is sitting over here. And we have uh, two of 18 of the grandchildren. Uh, Mark and Lisa are over here with us today. People ask me questions about the uh, grandchildren, and um, I can be, I'm very proud that uh, we have 18, and I can name them all, but my wife can get, knows the birthdays of all 18, plus the great-grandchildren, so she keeps me in line in that way. But it is a real delight to be here today and talk about some very important things, and that, of course, is a, a campaign that's coming up. And uh, we're, we're getting more excited all the time about what's happening. Somebody asked me on the way in, how, how does it look compared to four years ago? Quite dramatically different, because we did gain a lot of support four years ago, but it didn't go away. Those numbers who joined us and became aware of uh, the things that I had been doing, uh, their numbers have grown, doubled and tripled, and it continues to grow. So there's every reason to be optimistic about what we've, we've been doing. A lot of people ask exactly why is that the case? Um, I've been giving the same speech over and over again for a good many years. Why all of a sudden? Well, I think for, for a lot of different reasons. I, I, I believe one of the biggest uh, changes that's occurred is that most Americans now have come to the conclusion that there is something seriously flawed with the policy of this country, and they're failing. And it's not only we who believe in less government and um, the principles of liberty, but those who are on the receiving end, they're getting a little worried too because they know the gravy train is over. The country is poorer. The government is poorer. The debt is skyrocketing. Our personal liberties are being undermined. That even though those individuals who promoted and thought that wars were so necessary have come to the conclusions that we're in way too many wars and it's time to stop them and time to bring our troops home. Yeah. is this good policy and it follows the Constitution, it's good economics, we can't afford them any longer and it's uh, a move that has to be made and I think it's also something very practical when it comes to politics. It's a heck of a lot easier in saying let's cut out the foreign welfare and this foreign militarism well, before you have to attack child health care. So I think politically there's a lot of dynamite in this. That you go after that type of spending, and yet we still have to deal with all the other problems here. There's no doubt that it's totally out of control. And this lends itself to an opportunity as much as anything. Because there's been a lot of people around, not myself alone, but those that I've studied over the years, the people who have written and explained free market economics, they have warned a long time ago. Matter of fact, studying Austrian economics in the 1960s, uh, I was very impressed, but uh, they had at that time predicted, well, we can't keep doing this. We can't keep printing money and pretending that our dollar is as good as gold at $35 an ounce. And they said, it won't work, it won't work. And they were absolutely right. In August of 1971, it collapsed and we defaulted. I mean, they're worried about defaulting now. We defaulted on the American people in the 30s, 
We took the gold in. We wouldn't give them the gold, although we promised them the gold. And then in 1971, we, we refused to pay the gold to the foreigners. That was a signal to me that the Austrian economists were right and that we were ushering in a new age. And the new age that we have today that we're suffering from started in August of 1971. There were no restraints on spending, no restraints on borrowing, no restraints on the printing press. And now we're in this mess, and most people know it, and they're already starting to talk about what will be the alternatives. It isn't only our side that talks about going back to the Constitution of sound money and limited government. The people who want to be in charge are also very much aware that the dollar cannot last as the reserve currency of the world. So guess what and guess who is trying to design the next stage? And that is the internationalists. They want to have control of the next fiat currency under the United Nations and the IMF, and I'm arguing the case that we should no to that. We should say yes to our Constitution. Yeah. The one thing that is characteristic of a country that extends itself too far overseas, and many, many great nations have done that, it usually ends up badly and we end up, uh, and they end up with the whole system breaking down. And we, we do have an empire. We're in, we're in 130 some countries. We have 900 bases and we're building embassies. Every country we go into, we're building another embassy. We, they talk about coming back from Iraq. I mean, we still have a lot of troops there. We're still losing people over there. And even if you get rid of the military and we can put a puppet government in there, do you think we're going to leave that embassy, a billion-dollar embassy that we built? It's a fortress. It's bigger than the Vatican. And we've done this in the various countries, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq and Pakistan, but the people don't like it. We might be able to buy support from these governments for a while, but ultimately the people finally will reject those governments. That's what's happening in the Middle East today and in Central Asia. They're sick and tired of all that, and that is that... The that our presence there precipitates a lot of hostility, and right now we pick and choose on which side to support. Obama decided to support the rebels in Libya, and um, not much of a case can be made for that, but they say he wanted to make the case for it. You know what he's supposed to do? He's supposed to come and ask Congress to support it. He went to the United Nations and asked the United Nations for the support and then went and did it anyway and excluded you in the Congress. So they, they should not be doing these things. They, we should be doing exactly the opposite. But um, we, we decided, our government decided that it would support the rebels in Libya. And Libya, uh, those rebels probably have Al-Qaeda involved in it. But right now in Bahrain, the same kind of riots are going on and demonstrations against the government. But, you know, there happens to be a little bit of oil over there, and we have some strategic naval bases in Bahrain. So what, what is happening? We're sending weapons to the government of Bahrain in order for them to suppress the people who are sick and tired of their puppet government over there. This is why it is so attractive to settle these, not, not so much that we can be wise enough to say, well, I'm smart enough, I'll know who to pick the good guys and who the bad guys are and work it out. But the founders said and advised and our Constitution said we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to stay out of the internal affairs of other nations, stay out of entangling alliances, provide protection for this country, defend our country, be willing to talk to people and trade with people, engage with people, but not to get in their face. You know, in, 19, uh, in the year 2000, the Republicans won the uh, presidential race, and uh, the candidate then, George Bush, uh, had a proposal for foreign policy. He was criticizing Clinton. He said that we should not be in nation building. Uh, we should not be bothering and getting involved in internal affairs of the, of the nation, and we should have a humble foreign policy. I sort of like that, and it's not like what we're talking about now is brand new. Many Republicans in the past have talked this way, and uh, there's a big talk today about how long should we keep funding the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, NATO. 
NATO is the military arm right now of the UN, and they're fighting the war in Libya. Well, I think just going back to our history and looking at what Robert Taft, Mr. Republican, the senator from Haya, said when they were setting up NATO. He says, don't join it. Eventually, it'll become a police force and get us involved in things that we shouldn't be involved in. So it's not like we're talking about something strange. We're talking about some very commonsensical things, and it's uh, part of the Constitution. But as far as I can see, uh, from now on in, into the next year's election, the number one issue. Foreign policy is going to be important. We can't avoid it because it doesn't have an economic consequence. But the big issue right now for most people in this country is the economy. Loss of jobs and loss of prosperity, the depreciation of the currency, and no matter what type of spin they put on this, it doesn't look good. Because we got into this mess in a very precise manner. But those in charge in Washington, whether it's in Treasury, whether it's in the Federal Reserve, or whether it's our leadership in the Congress, they do not ask and they do not understand how we got into this mess. They don't ask about, they want to deal with the bursting of the bubble, but they don't ask where did the bubble come from? Well, the bubble came from too much spending, too much borrowing too many regulations, too much taxes, and then relying on the Federal Reserve to create unlimited amounts of, of, of credit, and that causes distortions and malinvestment and causes things like the housing bubble and NASDAQ bubble. So they don't blame the right people for it, and then they come up with this crazy idea that said, you know, if we would just spend more money, it would solve all our problems. Money they don't have. And it's sort of like saying, you know, you're totally bankrupt and bank, and finally the bankers say, you can't have another credit card. And then you say, well, the only thing I can do is find, you know, spend more money. What am I going to do? So in, in the case of a government, they just keep, their credit card lasts a lot longer. It always lasts until they destroy the money. And that's what, that, that is what they're working on. They're the destruction of money. So this economy is not going to improve by doing exactly the same things that caused our crisis. But now we're working on a new tax. No, we're not going to raise the income tax level, and we're not going to do that. But there's going to be a tax that hit us all next year, but it's already starting, and that's the inflation tax. Because when you print the money, you depreciate the currency, and when the currency goes down, prices go up, and that's how the standard of living goes down, and that's how you liquidate debt. They believe, the opposition, the Federal Reserve and others, believe precisely that they should be doing that. Because I have asked them questions, and they said, well, I said, what you're doing is uh, actually hurting the people who want to take care of themselves. You want to have artificially low interest rates for the bank benefit of the banks. But what happens to the people who decide they believe they have a responsibility to take care of themselves, and they may be in retirement, they don't trust the stock market, so they put it in CDs. Well, what do they make? They make 1 or 2%, and then you pay taxes, and then you have the depreciation of the currency. When I asked them that, they sort of blew it off. They said, well, that's just one of the consequences that happened. So they really don't care about the people. They care about bailing out their, their friends. And that is what they have done to the tune of trillions of trillions of dollars. So we have to reassert ourselves, whether it's on foreign policy or monetary policy, fiscal policy, or our personal liberties. Because ultimately, the driving uh, ideas that, uh, that keep me going is the protection of your liberty. Because I believe if we can protect your liberty, your right to life, your right to your liberty, and the right to the fruits of your labor, and get the government off your back and out of your wallet, that even if you had a bad year, if you had your freedom back, I believe we'd all be back on our feet again, and the country would be prosperous. Unfortunately, as the economy grows, there's more authoritarianism. As, a, as the government relies on war, war is the health of the state, so the state grows. And then they use fear and intimidation, whether it's uh, on foreign policy or whether it's fiscal. You have to react, you have to react. And then they tell you, in order to, for us to make sure you're safe and secure, you're going to have to give up some of your liberties. I don't buy that. I don't believe you ever have to give up any of your liberties to be safe and secure. I recall very vividly the week or so after 
because that was the period of time where they dug up the Patriot Act. And the Patriot Act, at least a version of it, had been floating around for years because there were always people there that wanted to put those kind of burdens on us. They always wanted the TSA and other instruments. So they thought this was a wonderful opportunity. And you can find some neoconservatives actually saying, this is an opportunity for us. And we will make, take, make a benefit, take, take a benefit of this, take advantage of this. So right afterwards, of course, that they, they pulled all these plans together and put it in a, in a bill, threw it on the floor with about an hour's worth of debate, and that was it. And then you had to vote in the atmosphere of falling 9-11 for the Patriot Act. And, of course, I voted against the Patriot Act because I didn't think it was patriotic. So I asked other, uh, I asked other members, why are you voting for this? You know, there could be some very bad stuff in here. He said, yeah, that's true, but... How can you vote against the Patriot Act under these circumstances? Well, you know, the circumstances plus the name of the bill goes a long way in Washington because uh, sometimes they're rather superficial. Um, but but the, the question is, what if they had taken the Patriot Act and wanted to do this and they were honest? What if they said this uh, the, and put and titled the bill, Repeal of the Fourth Amendment? How many people would have voted for it? You know, they'd have had a hard time. But that is what the Patriot Act does. It repeals the Fourth Amendment. You have essentially no privacy left. And uh, just think of what's going on at our airports. Instead of understanding foreign policy and why people want to commit suicide terrorism and why there's blowback and all these things, what they, uh, what they want to do is they want us to concentrate on Americans, now we're all suspects, and that's what you are at the airport. And whether you're 92 years old in the wheelchair, you're still a suspect. I mean, it is just out of control. And uh, I think the American people hopefully will, will get uh, fed, fed up with this because uh, it, it, it doesn't make us safer. There's good ways to solve our problems, understanding of, uh, of the foreign policy as well as understanding how private, private enterprise can take care of our safety. And, and I'll give you a hint on how most private individuals take care of themselves. It's related to the Second Amendment. That's how you are safe and secure. But we have an opportunity now in the next months and years because something has to give. The, the, the ideas of liberty are alive and well. They are growing. There's a grand contest going on on those who want to take from those who work and produce. And uh, the country has run out of wealth. All we have is debt. The production is down. The good jobs have over, gone overseas. Uh, a weak currency never helps, and that's what they're doing. But we have an opportunity because I am convinced that we have the right ideas of this. And it isn't like a brand new idea and tinkering with the tax code and tinkering here and there. It's really radical. It's following the Constitution and do it completely. mess by not following the law of the land and I think we can get back out of this trouble by following it. And uh, sound economic policy, yes, as I mentioned, you can have a tough year for, for the correction. You have to have a correction after years and years of mismanagement and causing all this building up of debt. But to prop it up by worthless paper, as the Federal Reserve now owns worthless paper and indirectly we own it, and the people who made all the money when the bubbles were formed, they're the ones who got the bailout. And what did the people got, get? They ended up getting, you know, losing their job, losing their mortgage, and losing their houses. And uh, that has to be reversed. And it is not that difficult. But a lot of people are waking up. And there's a lot of enthusiasm. I'm particularly enthusiastic and encouraged by the young people in the college campuses where I go. They're looking at sound economic policy. They love the Constitution. They believe in self-reliance, as all of us must if we want to recuperate from this. America has great traditions. This system cannot prevail. We cannot maintain our empire, just as the Soviets couldn't maintain their empire, and it broke down. 
but they were in a much more precarious situation, and they, did, they didn't have the history of the respect for civil liberties. They didn't have the history of the Constitution. They didn't have a bill of rights. They didn't have understanding of private property and sound money and contract rights. We have that. But we have to get our confidence back and an understanding. You need to understand economic policy. You need to understand our history. And that this whole idea that if you're opposed to something, that means you don't care about poor people. Well, I'll tell you what. The opposition has created all the poor people of this world, and that's why we must make our message loud and clear. So I appreciate very much you coming out and the support that you have given. If you have not been a supporter, I'd love you to join because it is very important that we do. And uh, what happens on August 13 is a good bellwether. You know, it, it certainly is. And this is this, the state and you can play an important role. This is where you don't have to have 10 million people get an endorsement. You don't have to have $30 million. You need people who are energized understand what the issues are and willing to put the effort in not only to go on uh, August 13th but also to bring people in and to do the voting because it's a powerful message so you can be empowered by this because you're in a special state at a special time so this is our goal this is what we have to do because if the campaign is to continue you have to have the momentum you we have to continue the momentum and I to tell you the truth, I was very, very surprised at the amount of uh, support we got in the last campaign. I was never doubtful about the message. I was doubtful about other things, about the reception and my delivery and all these things. I was doubtful. But I was really, really encouraged last time on the numbers of people. But what really impressed me was the numbers of people continuing to join even when there wasn't a campaign. Of course, we called it the Campaign for Liberty, which is an ongoing campaign. So I am excited about what's happening. I am very hopeful. I believe restoration of confidence in the belief of liberty will solve our problems. And I thank you very much. And then afterwards, everybody here can meet Ron Paul. I'd ask if you have your cameras and pens ready since there's so many people here. So 10 or 15 minutes, the media will ask some questions, and afterwards everybody can, can mingle. So go ahead.